you, Dr. Tolin, <clears throat> and thank you for organizers to, for an invitation. Yesterday, a lot of researchers, they presented the data on the world incidence on the breast cancer. So I removed these slides, not showing the data, but when we put a microscope on the data and try to understand what is going on, the data clearly shows that developed countries like Northern America and the Northern Europe, the incidence of the breast cancer is higher compared to the countries like uh, South America and the Mediterranean countries, which has an intermediate rate, and the developing countries like Africa and Asia has much lower rate. So in the well developed countries, it is like 98 per 100,000 incidents is being observed compared to the developing countries, which is about 19 cases per 100,000. Many researchers do not believe because they think the data in these developing <coughs> countries are not being reported. The cases are not being reported. So I put the emphasis on the US data where every case has been reported on the ethnicity data. And we see the clearly the same kind of the patterns where the Caucasians and the black partners has a higher incidence of the breast cancer compared to the Asian and the Hispanics. The same thing happens with the mortality data. So the question comes that what is happening here? So this is a summary slide. Let me go back. So definitely there is a lifestyle difference between the people from these different origins. So this slides definitely explain that we expect that one out of eight women will have a breast cancer in their lifetime. Every three minutes, one woman is diagnosed with a breast cancer in the US. Every 11 minutes, one woman die from the breast cancer. In UK, about 30,000 women are diagnosed with the breast cancer, and 200 men are diagnosed with the breast cancer in UK. So this is seriously raising a big issue that what is happening. We also know that when we cook the meat, especially the mussels meat at a high temperature, it produces the heterocyclic amines, and these heterocyclic amines act like a estrogen. So when you are cooking the meat, the meat byproducts like creatine and keratine, in presence of the simple sugars like the glucose, they form the heterocyclic amines like fit. There are about two dozen different kinds of the heterocyclic amines are produced during this process. Among those, FIP is the one which is very potent and also in the higher concentrations, about 10 to 50 times higher than the other heterocyclic amines. FIP can be multiplied to either with the ring hydroxylated compound or to the N-hydroxy compound, which is genotoxic in nature. Unfortunately, the human machinery metabolized the FIP to this pathway. Not to, the in hydrox not to the ring hydroxylated compound. These compounds are not toxic, but the metabolites of the N-hydroxy products are carcinogenic. So FIP is being metabolized into three phases. In the phase one, cytochrome P450 converted the FIP to the N-hydroxy FIPs and the SALT1 and so on. And the byproducts of the FIP produces the DNA adder formation. It has also been reported that during this metabolism, the reactive oxygen species are being produced, which also cause the problem. So there are twofold uh, problems by consuming the heterocyclic amines in our diet. By formation of the DNA adduct formation as well as the hetero, sorry, the ROS. So definitely the way I look at it, that the diet is a most uh, critical thing among these different ethnicities. We are also know that the fruits, vegetables, and spices are known for 
many, many different properties, anti-cancer property, anti-inflammatory property, you name it, it has been shown by many, many researchers that the phytochemicals which is found in these fruits and vegetables support the health. So what I want to understand, so we hypothesize that along with the cooked meat or barbecue meat or overcooked meat, which is having carcinogens, we have a combination of these phytochemicals, probably they may suppress or reduce the toxicity of those heterocyclic amines. So we wanted to know that which phytochemical is crucial and how, what they do what kind of the inhibition it takes place. So we started the experiment with the, it's all in vitro study. We use the MCS10 A cell model, which is the normal cell lines, use the different concentrations of the FAPE and find out that, okay, what dose we should test. We identify like 50 micromolar and 250 micromolar, two doses we uh, decided to use it. Then we tested several different uh, phytochemicals and developed, so before testing the phytochemicals, we developed a model system just by using the known antioxidant, the synthetic antioxidant like anestyl cysteine, glutathione, and vitamin C, whether the system works or not. We used comet assay, which is also known as a single cell um, elect gel electrophoresis. In this, so you have a control cells, you treat the cells, you harvest the cells, and plate them on the uh, microscopic slides, lyse them, and then do the electrophoresis and score for the DNA damage. So this is a very nice model where you can see that if the control cells, there is no DNA damage detected, a lower dose of the FIPS causes the DNA damage and the higher dose of the FIPS causes the more DNA damage. So it really gave us a very good model system to test it. When we added the NS, uh, NS trial 16, you can see that there is a protection in the DNA damage. After that, we tested the different phytochemicals as listed in the previous slides. I've not shown the data of everything, but we did just to summarize, to show you that we did for 24 hours, 48 hours, and 72 hours, like gingerol 6, gingerol 10, and curcumin, and based on that, we identified that which is the phytochemical that is protecting or inhibiting the FIPS cytotoxicity, based on the comet acid data and based on the cell survival. And then we score these phytochemicals and we found that the curcumin is the one at 150 micromolars is inhibiting the FIPS cytotoxicity. We wanted to know that how and what is happening when we are adding the curcumin. So when you have untreated cells, FIPS, I have not shown the data with the 50 micromolars, but when you have the increasing concentration of the uh, curcumin, you can see that the, on the dose-dependent manner, there is a protection and cells do not die. As I said, the FIP also causes the ROS, reactive oxygen species. So we added, we did the experiment by DCFSA and find out that, yes, there is a, So with the increasing concentration of the FIP, you can see that the second column, you have a ROS induction, and at a higher level, you have a much uh, uh, induction of the ROS, but when you add the uh, curcumin, the ROS has been reduced. On the right-hand side, you see the panel, the control, there is no fluorescence, whereas in the 50 to 250, you can see a lot of fluorescence is there, and when the curcumin is added, that fluorescence is almost gone. So we have shown that, yes, curcumin reduces the ROS production. As the FIP is known for the DNA duct formation, so there is no antibody commercially available except one person in Japan, he developed the antibody for the FIP DNA duct formation. We did the immunofluorescence assay, we standardized the technique, and shown that when you have the FIP, 
the DNA adduct formation happens. So you can see on the second column and the third column, these are the repeated. But when we added the curcumin, that DNA adduct formation does not take place. As I said, the comet assay to detect the DNA damage. So on the upper panel, we show the olive tail moment, which is an induction of how much DNA damage is taking place. The bottom panel is showing the pictures, so representative pictures of those DNA damage. So with the presence of curcumin, you can see that the DNA damage is almost being negligible, or almost like the control level. We also focus on the apoptosis. So when we have the increasing those, the dotted lines shows that the apoptosis in the treated cells just by the 50 and the 250 micromolar concentration. But when we added the curcumin, the apoptosis also reduced, which makes the sense. When there is no DNA damage, there is no DNA duct formation, there is no need for the apoptosis in cells remain in the normal condition. Then we wanted to understand that, okay, what is having, happening at the gene expression level? So we, using the RT-PCR, we tested several of the different genes which involve in the antioxidant activity like NERF2 and the FOXA pathway. So if you see the NPO1, GPX1, and GSA, all those are being induced by treating with the FIP in a dose-dependent manner. But when the curcumin is added, that induction of these increased expression is being reduced. Whereas the BRCA1 is also induced by the FIP, but when you have the curcumin, the, base, the levels reaches to the basal level. Same thing happened with the PARP, and whereas the P16, which is a tumor suppressor genes, is being suppressed by the FIP, but is being induced by the curcumin. So yes, something is happening here. We try to understand and understand that the FIP induces all these antioxidant genes, NERF2 and the FOXA pathway, but when you have the curcumin present, then those are not required because there is no ROS induction is happening and those genes, higher activation is not needed. <laughs> In case of the P16 gene, so the FIP is suppressing the P16, the tumor suppressor genes, but it has been induced in presence of the curcumin. We confirm some of those genes by the protein expression, by breast and blood. We also try to understand that what is happening at the apoptosis, so yes, it goes through the caspase 3 and caspase 9 pathway, which is involved and come from like catalase and the GPX, it shows the same way the expression. So to summarize what we can say that when you have the FIP and it is being metabolized by the P450 pathway, it produces the ROS and also the metabolite produces the DNA adduct formation. But when we added the curcumin, the ROS induction goes down and that's why the GPX, NPO1, and GSR, all these genes, they are not expressing at high level. Curcumin also inhibit the double-stranded DNA break. Um, histone modifications are also been reduced in the presence of the curcumin. And we didn't see the DNA duct formation in presence of the curcumin. So curcumin is playing by the multiple pathway in case of the FIP-induced damages or cytotoxicity. So the scientific community is definitely doing a lot of work on the curing the breast cancer. Yes, that research is needed. And because of that research, we have a lot of breakthroughs and it continue to be required. I have talked to many, many of the breast cancer sur sur uh, survivals, and they say that they change their dietary habits after the breast cancer. Once the chemotherapy happens, they have added the fruits and the vegetables in the diet to avoid the reoccurrence. 
But my point is that if we can prevent the breast cancer, just by curing, we are not seeing the big change or the differences. But if we can start advising and educating the young generation and find the new ways to prevent the breast cancer, probably that may be a better way to go from here. So why not we focus on the prevention? At this point, I would like to acknowledge the financial support I received from the DOD and NIH. Uh, my collaborators at the Medical College of Georgia uh, and Dr. Takahashi, who provided me the DNA adapt antibodies and the organizers of this uh, meeting. Thank you. Any question? So the 150 micromolar of the curcumin concentration is effective at the 250 micromolar of the FIP. Normally in the food, the concentration is about same, 150 and so on. So that's in the food. So what do you get in the plasma as a person? So if you're, in the plasma? If, if you're comparing your cell cultures, you need to be comparing that to the plasma. So, what so honestly, we do not calculate what is the concentration in the plasma or in the serums because these studies are only on the in vitro. So we try to correlate whether there is an effect or not. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.